Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the second as and colloquium of the semester. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Dibble. He has been an a uh, as and since the beginning, about 11, 12 years ago. So he'll be talking about uh, Power to the People, uh, which is a rather cool title, I think, uh, on biofuels. So Professor Dibble. to be here, uh, and uh, um, I was invited to give uh, to our uh, MC here uh, some information about myself, but I said I'll just uh, I'll tell you my, about myself myself. And uh, I was an undergraduate here at Cal from 1968 through 1971, and it's one of those uh, uh, memorable times that people say, if you remember those years, you weren't here. And <laughs> Um, it was exciting times. I graduated from chemical engineering, and then I went on to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin in chemical engineering. Uh, in the chemical engineering, I worked uh, with a, I made a laser, and it was an uh, infrared laser. It was an electric discharge, and it was a carbon monoxide laser. Um, I had a thing called a shock tube, which uh, is a, just a long cylinder, uh, about you know, a couple inches, well, five inches in diameter, and I put in some gases in that tube, and a shock tube, you sent a shock wave through this tube, and behind the shock wave, uh, the gas temperature jumps up rapidly. Like in a microsecond, it'll jump up to, uh, say, 1,000 uh, Kelvin. And so I put in various combustible mixtures that, as an intermediate state, would produce carbon monoxide. And uh, I would shock heat carbon disulfide and oxygen, and the temperature would jump up, and uh, this reaction would pr proceed, producing carbon monoxide. But kind of interesting, um, and a, a very dynamic picture I try to paint for you is, you have an oxygen atom that collides with carbon and sulfur. So here's carbon in the middle, and sulfur over here, and oxygen collides on this side. Now, the electrons are kind of in a bond here with the carbon-sulfur, but then they they can look over here and see that this oxygen penetrates hard, hits it hard, and they, they have a choice. Can they bond with the oxygen or not? And they decide yes, because the sulfur turns out it's pretty big. Uh, uh, oxygen's smaller. There are oxygens above sulfur on the periodic table. Anyway, the uh, oxygen and the uh, carbon then form a bond, and then the, the electrons that formerly were around the carbon-sulfur bond aren't there. And so now the kind of, uh, those electrons shielded the, sh the positive nuclei from seeing each other. Well, they're not there anymore. So now the positive nuclei of sulfur and carbon are looking at other, each other, and so they push apart. It's Coulombic uh, repulsion. And that push pushes the carbon into the oxygen. And you'd think the whole thing flies off at great velocity, but actually it doesn't. It spring loads the carbon monoxide, and it leaves this reaction highly vibrationally excited. And so that's why I had a carbon monoxide laser, is I could interrogate what vibrational state the carbon monoxide was in. And so that's what I started out doing, was laser uh, interrogation of chemical reactions in, say, 1971, 72. We had our first uh, uh, oil uh, shortage in 1973. And it really changed things a lot. And in case I forget, uh, i got to say that things are looking kind of familiar again. Uh, you know, after s some period of time. But, but for example, I grew up in Las Vegas. I always said I was a suburb of Los Angeles. And from Wisconsin to go visit my parents in Las Vegas, I remember driving my Volkswagen Beetle from Wisconsin to Las Vegas, and it cost me $17 in gasoline in 1971. Okay, and, uh, and gasoline was like 35 cents a gallon. And I, even then, I remarked to myself, gee, that doesn't seem like a lot of money for a lot of transport that, to get from one place to another. Anyway, in, during the winter of 73, we had a shortage of fuel, and uh, I made that same trip, but I also had uh, 20 gallons of gasoline in the back seat of my car because I was in a chemical engineering department. I knew where to get gas cans and so on, so you, had, you, you couldn't count on there being gasoline. So, so times... Times were kind of funny. Why would I drive around? In retrospect, I think that's pretty crazy to be driving around with a lot of gasoline in your car, but, you know, we did silly things. So and then the, the title of my thesis changed you know, from being interrogation of species with a laser, kind of looking at the laser physics, it became something more like uh, oxidation of hydrocarbons. And I, I moved with the times. And fortunately, uh, 
And stimulated by those times, there became a National Science Foundation uh, postdoctoral fellowship opportunity, which I applied for. And uh, I got a one-year postdoc in uh, Imperial College, London, England, to learn about combustion. And that changed my life. So I've been in combustion ever since. Uh, when I come back from Imperial College, um, I found a job at the newly formed combustion research facility that was out here in Livermore, and I did lots of laser diagnostics and flames. Um, after uh, 15 years, uh, I working at Sandia Labs, which was kind of a Bell Labs, and I, and I, I laugh when, I, when uh, uh, Steve Chu, giving a lecture here, he says that his, his uh, Nobel Prize was paid for by your mom and dad's long-distance phone calls because he worked at Bell Labs. I had to smile. Well, I kind of... I had a similar great experience myself working at Bell Labs. Anyway, I joined the faculty here in 1990, and uh, having done lots of chemical engineering, you'll see that I got more and more involved, or my involvement in combustion is, is through the fuels. And so I'm going to show you a talk that talks about various biofuels, and then I'm going to talk about one application of the engines that I work on, and I'll explain that engine, of how I made electrical power. And then if you'd be sure and remind me, I'll tell you how I spent $16 million of Enron's money uh, and uh, contributed to their uh, uh, bankruptcy, okay? So, and, and that was the, the real power to the people program. So make sure I get to that point, okay? Let's see, I've got a laser pointer here, and I guess that page down. Um, the, next, the next slide is uh, not confidential. It's just a, a, a note from, uh, that's happening all across the country. That is, every mechanical engineering department and other departments are saying nowadays that we need to uh, talk about energy and we need to rediscover energy. And I've seen some numbers that uh, our own department had uh, 13 people that could call themselves energy circa 1980 and uh, say 75 to 80. And right now we say we have nine. So uh, our numbers have gone down and we're, we're starting to ramp up. But that's true all across the, the world. Everybody, every department is saying, hmm, now we've got to go back and do some energy things. Um, those are just numbers. We'll get that. And so, yeah, I think you've seen this picture before here in this same audience. Uh, it's, it's where I, uh, uh, I actually first saw this picture uh, in this room at an AS&T symposium. And uh, it turns out if you, uh, I, I asked the guy for a copy of the picture, and it took a long time to find it. I never got it from him. If you just Google on the web, you know, and look for positive proof of global warming, you'll find this picture, okay? <laughs> so, um, Kind of, kind of interesting times, and so why is this up here about global warming? I have to tell you that in my business, the most interesting thing that happened was it, we had a tilt that happened during this Hurricane Katrina. It's not that the hurricane itself had anything, you know, really, you know, changed things dramatically. I think things were just coming to a head, and that was just the last drop of water that made the bucket overflow or cause things to tilt, if you will. And, and what was happening? Things were that the, the um, emerging countries of uh, India and China were drawing on the oil supplies more and more. Um, we're, we're, uh, you know, the supply was not keeping up with demand, so naturally the price is gradually drifting, gradually drifting, and you'll see, you'll see some interesting prices, even uh, you know, ancient by one year standards in, the, in this talk. Uh, at the same time, we have this thing of global warming. And I have to tell you, importantly, that when I was a postdoc at Imperial College, I took lots of short courses in combustion. And I can tell you that never, uh, well, they assured me that by the year 2000, there would be no petroleum left and we'd all be burning coal. But there was lots of coal and we'd be out of petroleum. And so that prophecy didn't happen. And, and also, we never talked about carbon dioxide at Imperial College. It was never a pollutant. I mean, carbon dioxide was just carbon dioxide, okay? And... Uh, so it's, uh, to me, quite surprising, or I'm, I'm careful to make predictions because I realize that, you know, uh, time has a, uh, can, can make these predictions not look so good. So, uh, or what's Yogi Berra say, it's hard to make predictions about, especially about the future. So let's move on then into my talk, and I'm showing you now that we have, so two things. Global warming has really emphasized, I'd say, as much as anything, uh, what to do about uh, petro petroleum. And, in fact, the argument is that, you know, as we burn petroleum, we're adding more CO2 to the atmosphere, and the CO2 is building up, and so we have this greenhouse effect. Um, therefore, there's a lot of interest in alternate fuels, 
And if you start thinking of alternate fuels, then you're back to the some, uh, you know, concepts like octane number. Now you see that at the pump, but you wonder, what am I buying? So I want to give you a short course on octane number, and that's here. So octane sounds like it's going to be an 8. You'd think it's just a, a C8 hydrocarbon. Well, it actually is, but in fact, if you're an organic chemist, you call it actually pentane with three extra methyl groups. So there it is. It's pentane, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then there's a methyl group right there, and there, and there. And these methyl groups, to an organic chemist, there's so much hydrogen, you just don't draw it, okay? So every time you see a carbon, actually there's, there's three hydrogens, there's four bonds on any carbon. So there's three hydrogens there, three hydrogens there, three, three, three. There's one right there and one, two on that carbon right there. Now, we look at, turns out those hydrogens, where there's three of them, is uh, what we call a primary hydrogen. And on this molecule, there are 15 primary hydrogens, two secondary, and one tertiary. Tertiary is that one right there. That's secondary right there. It turns out it's a lot harder to pluck a primary hydrocarbon. So to, to a hydrogen atom that's going to attack this molecule and pull off a hydrogen, emerging as H2, leaving this you know, as a radical, it finds octane is actually kind of a fortress. That's why I call it that. And we give this the number, just by arbitrarily, we define this as octane 100. Now, right here is almost the same molecule, only straight chain. Straight chain, and it's C7, and we define that to be octane number 0. And if you put, so this stuff really uh, reacts uh, uh, quite readily, and why? It's because it's got only six primaries. It's got three right there, three right there, and the rest of them are secondary. So it's easier for a for a radical like oxygen, OH, or H to collide with this molecule and abstract a hydrogen. So this molecule will readily fall apart. And so in your engine, as you piston compresses, you spark ignite it, and a flame starts cro crossing over uh, the piston. Actually, as the uh, flame is progressing over the piston, it is compressing the gases ahead of it, as well as burning into it. And that compression uh, raises the temperature, and this molecule will explode ahead of the flame front, and that's what knock is. So when you put in n-heptane, your engine will knock, okay? And uh, uh, in, in our lab, we have an ancient piece of equipment from 1948, and it's still a very active uh, research equipment, and we can change the compression ratio. So we can put in octane in this engine, and you turn a crank while it's running, and you crank up the compression ratio until it's, I can, can't even remember it, but you'll hear it knock, and it's designed to knock. So you hear it go tap, 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 tap and we call that octane 100. Then you put in this stuff, and it knocks a lot, and you have to turn the crank back three times, and it, lower, it, expand, it raises the head, and it lowers the compression ratio. So amazing, and then uh, after you've done that three times, we define that to be zero, and if we put in some odd fuel, and it's somewhere like halfway between zero and, and 100, we'd call it 50. So this machine defines the octane number, and it's still largely how we define octane number. So. Uh, yeah, I got one other comment. In, in addition to a, abstracting a hydrogen, if you, if you actually abstract a hydrogen, say, here, this long molecule can actually fold on itself and, and abstract yet another hydrogen. So the fact that this molecule can fold on itself makes it more reactive than this molecule, which is already a pretty tight cluster. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of structure involved in, in knowing how fuels behave in a car. Um, now there's a lot. How many people know that when you go to the gas pump, you're buying ethanol? Mm, well, you know, I'd say about 75% are saying yes. I should ask the reverse question, maybe. Uh, turns out, in California, I'd say right now, your gasoline has somewhere between 6 and 10% ethanol. And the state of California is importing 1 billion gallons of ethanol a year. Uh, probably like one-third of the production of the United States is coming to California. And we're, we're getting ethanol from corn sugar uh, via fermentation. Now, uh, I'll get to this uh, later. We can actually make uh, corn, uh, ethanol from syngas, and that means synthesis gas, which is CO and hydrogen, via a Fischer-Tropes process, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, if you were in a refinery, you would make it from ethylene, this simple molecule right here, and you can insert, if you will, a water molecule in there, and that adds H3 there, and it'd be an OH on that, and that's ethanol, okay? Now, corn to ethanol is now increasingly uh, considered not the best because it's not a low-carbon fuel, 
if you do your homework, and uh, most famous is uh, Professor uh, uh, Tad, what's his last name? Uh, Patsick, Patsick, uh, who's famous and uh, who's pointed out that corn to ethanol, for every gallon of corn, uh, every gallon of ethanol we make, we make about, uh, we use one gallon of diesel fuel. So the ethanol has a carbon footprint of one gallon of diesel, so we don't consider ethanol a low carbon fuel. Okay? Um, cane sugar is a lot better. It says uh, for every uh, gallon of diesel fuel that you invest in uh, cane sugar, you'll get 10, time, 10 gallons of ethanol. So that's, that's, that's good, but it grows in tropical climates, i.e. like Brazil or uh, Philippines and so on. Um, I'm, I'm told that cane does grow in, say, Louisiana, for example. Um, uh, the state of Montana said, okay, we will, uh, we will insist on ethanol and gasoline whenever somebody in Montana can make ethanol from, for, uh, from a Montana crop. So you have people experimenting with converting wheat to ethanol. But uh, here we are again talking about uh, food and fuel. And uh, this is, this is uh, some, if you bother to notice, and I, I, I was taught this just last month, but if you notice, the oil refiners tend to avoid anything that has food to fuel. They don't want to go there, and they told me they got enough problems as it is, and they don't want to get, in, get into this uh, debate that's uh, starting to uh, develop. Uh, barley, same story. Uh, cellulose, that's wood, okay? Cellulose is a polymer of sugar, and if you break that polymer down, it's sugar, and then you've got ethanol, so more on that later. Now, here's the nice thing about ethanol, though. It has an octane number of 110, so it actually helps upgrade your gasoline. So a refiner can use a lower-cost gasoline, put in ethanol, and uh, you get a good octane number. Um, but lots of trouble is that ethanol is not very soluble in gasoline. It's because it's got that OH group right there. And for, in the case of California, we bring in long, long trains, about 100 cars long, called unit trains, um, full of ethanol. And I thought we'd bring them right to the refiners and, and blend it right at the, say, Richmond oil refinery. But we don't even do that because the ethanol, if you put it in the pipeline, uh, will fall out whenever you find a little puddle of water inside the pipeline. And they tell me there's lots of puddles of water inside the pipeline. So ethanol is blended into your gasoline at the last step before it goes into a truck and then hauled to a gas station. And that seems pretty inefficient, and, and it is. And so that's one of the major criticisms that we have with, uh, with, uh, with ethanol. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so you start thinking, can we do something else with ethanol? Well, it's, it's easy to make an ether right here but it has a really low octane number, so that's not going to be very popular. And it also has a high vapor pressure, so it's quite flammable, and that's a problem. So you start learning all these little issues about fuel that you take for granted. Vapor pressure, solubility, um, will it get into the water table, and so on like that. You can also make butanol, C4OH, okay, and that's kind of interesting, octane number 100. And uh, one of our colleagues uh, joined a startup company six months ago to, to, uh, to make butanol from sugar. And that company's in South Bay, and it's called Cobalt. So we'll see, uh, see how they do. Um, is in butanol, it's soluble in both gasoline and diesel fuel, so it's possible that this is a biofuel made, made from sugar. And uh, I mentioned to some refiners, well, you can also make the ether of butanol, which would look like this. And, and then I asked myself, hmm, how many, what would be the octane number of this thing? And the answer is it's probably going to be like in heptane because it's got 12 secondary hydrogens. So it's probably a low octane number of fuel. It's a straight chain. Now, um, we've talked about ethanol, and that goes into gasoline fuels. Um, now I'm going to talk about biodiesel. Heard plenty about that, and uh, I gave a talk on biodiesel, and uh, it's got... Uh, it's not real popular in the state of California because it produces a slight increase in nitric oxide when it's burning. So biodiesel has less, uh, how'd that happen? Okay, biodiesel has less uh, uh, particulates and some good properties, um, but the state of California really just, uh, you know, doesn't like that. Now, since biodiesel is from a uh, plant source, it does have a low carbon footprint, and it may be, and we're not there yet, but it may be that this is going to be acceptable because it has a low carbon footprint that we will tolerate that slight increase in NOx. No one's saying that really uh, yet, okay? Well, this picture is significant for another reason. Um, 
when you think of, if, if Detroit tries to tell you about diesel cars, they usually mean big V8s driving SUVs. And if you look over in Europe, a diesel car is usually a four-cylinder car with a, a, a much smaller uh, two-liter diesel engine. And over half the automobiles in Europe are small displacement diesel engines. And, uh, um, you know, they, they of course, uh, well, diesels, because of their higher compression ratio, have more efficiency. And so the fuel economy uh, of the fleet in Europe is like 30% higher than what we have here in the United States. And so it'll be interesting to watch the dieselization of America. Will it be more of these cars or will it be smaller cars? We don't know. Um, I've already said these things, that, diesel, that biodiesel is, quote, renewable, non-toxic, naturally derived. It's from vegetable oil. And by the way, it, it can, vegetable oil and animal fats are all triglycerides. We'll see that in a minute. And the triglycerides, you'd be astonished, but at the back of the restaurants all across the, the nation, people have to collect the waste oils. Those waste oils are gathered by what's called a, uh, 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 a renderer. And amazingly, those oils are, are uh, uh, strained, boiled, and then they become a food source. And it turns out one-third of the mass of a Christmas or Thanksgiving turkey is from rendered vegetable oil animal fats. And they worry about mad cow disease. Okay, those are prions that could end up in these waste oils. And so that's why they, they boil it, but they also know that's not enough. So... Uh, it's a remarkable industry, and as we start drawing on that for diesel fuel, it's going to impact a food source. So uh, let's follow that. Uh, uh, as I said, however, NOx is slightly increased by biodiesel. Okay? This is what the triglyceride looks like. Okay? It's a propane molecule with three oxygen groups there, and... This, this thing, R1, R2, and R3, is kind of subtle. It turns out that's a 15-hydrocarbon chain. So R1 is 15, R2 is like 15 or 16, and R3 is like 15 or 16. And they're seldom the same. There's, there's some triglycerides where R1 equals R2 equals R3, but most things not. So corn oil is one thing, R1, R2, and 3. Olive oil is something different. Peanut oil is yet different. But fundamentally, they all have this kind of structure right here. If you simply boil this in water, you'll break off this glycerin compound right here, which is now that's glycerin or glycerol right there. And in water, this becomes soap. So this process of making soap has been around for about 2,000, 3, well, 4,000 years for sure. But if you boil it in methanol instead of water, you, let's see, Instead of water, the methyl group right there ends up attaching right to that carbon right there. So now you have a, what what's called the methyl ester or the methyl ester of the fatty acid. That's a fatty acid, that's a fatty acid, and that's a fatty acid. And so this is what biodiesel is. So you've heard people making it in their backyard. They're cooking it up. They'll just get oils, throw in the methanol, and heat it. You've got to put in sodium hydroxide. Here we're putting in potassium hydroxide. It doesn't matter. It helps catalyze the reaction, okay? So you can make biodiesel. That's a really straightforward, easy process. Now, it says here, but don't forget, Bob, to tell them that there's another way of doing this. And it's called the heavy hydrogenation route. And if you take the oil, the triglyceride, and just put it in a hydrogen atmosphere, and I'm going to talk like, say, uh, uh, 300 pounds per square inch pressure, and at 300 Kelvin, quite a bit more of a, a uh, uh, trouble than this. But if you put hydrogen on this, you will, you will create water from all these oxygens. And what emerges will be propane right here. And those oxygens are gone. And you just simply have the, the straight chain R group. This is called renewable diesel in the literature. And if you see this in the, when you're reading, you'll, you might, OK? And you wonder, what's the difference between biodiesel and renewable diesel? Biodiesel has these oxygen groups. Renewable diesel has strictly the straight chain hydrocarbon. The state of California likes renewable diesel a lot more than the biodiesel. Um, they, you know, partly they don't like you, but the methanol is coming typically from coal, so they don't like the carbon footprint that that has associated with it. And the renewable diesel is really diesel fuel, so it's completely interchangeable with diesel. Uh, biodiesel has some issues in that it's, a, it's, because it has this oxygen group here, it's a better solvent. 
So if you put biodiesel in your car, you've got to do it a little bit at a time because you'll start to dissolve some of the crud that's built up in your tanks over the last five to ten years. And if somebody just says, okay, I'm going to fill up with biodiesel, usually their car filter plugs up on the, on the first use of it because you've, you put in so much biodiesel, it dissolves crud and stuff in the tank and the pipelines, and it gets stuck in the filter. So you've got to do that a little bit at a time. Uh, the Cal Fleet uh, that, that picks up stuff at the uh, uh, dormitories, is, uh, so there's some diesel trucks, and I advised them to go a little bit at a time, and uh, they, they were reluctant to do that. They actually just said, well, we're going to go 100% biodiesel, and, you know, it'd get, it plugged up, okay? But change the filters, it works, okay? Um, so there's nitric oxide bump up in biodiesel, and people are, you know, puzzled. Why? And one person said, well, it's because biodiesel has a different modulus of, of uh, uh, compression, and the fuel injector and the resulting spray is slightly different. And I thought, geez, do you have to be that creative? I don't think so. Uh, another person said, if you look, the equivalent number for diesels, like octane number, is called cetane number. And so a very long chain molecule has a cetane of 90. A short chain molecule is down here like 30. In fact, the cetane number is almost the inverse of the octane number. I should have a graph showing you that they are correlated on a negative line like that. Um, as it turns out, the higher the cetane number, it says the, the, the less NOx you get. And so people were trying to point out that, wait, I think that biodiesel has a higher cetane number, and therefore it should have less NOx. But in fact, the evidence is it doesn't quite work that way. So we don't, we don't go there. We can't come up with a cetane number as an explanation for the NOx. Now, I made the following proposal, and that is that the fuel chemistry is simply this, that the, there's double bonds in the back of that long R group, okay? And more double bonds mean more NOx. And I said, why? Because double bonds have a higher flame temperature. And that, that turns out to be pretty straightforward. So here's ethane. Uh, well, look, look at propane, propylene. Propane flame temperature is 1925. Propylene is 1935, slightly higher, only 10 Kelvin. Butane and butylene. Now, well, difference is 95 Kelvin for butylene versus uh, butane. So if you have a double bond, you actually will have a slightly higher flame temperature. And, and the, the, uh, the R groups in biodiesel actually have double bonds. And petrodiesel tends not to have it. So I'm now showing you kind of some of the research that we do in our group. And that is I, I did a numerical model where I found that I had a numerical model of propane and a numerical model of propylene. And also, I had uh, a, a methyl ester, looks like biodiesel right here. And I got some that have a double bond and one that doesn't. And we have a very simple chemistry model that says we, can, we, we will run a chemical reaction and numerically and see which one produces the most nitric oxide. Now, I take this opportunity to tell you that many times you'll see people say they want a computer to run faster. And it, it almost sounds like we're lazy. You know, why do you want it to run faster? Uh, and it's not because I want to get the job done faster and walk away. It's because you're probably going to run the job several hundred times. If you're really going to do a survey and try to understand, you keep trying one idea, try another idea, try another idea. Now, if the computer takes two weeks to get an answer, it's not very much fun. Uh, you almost forget the question you asked by the time you get the answer. So. Uh, when, when we speak that we want something to run quickly, it's because not because we just want to get something done and walk away from it. It's because we want to do it many, many times. Okay. Now this is, if you got nothing else out of this talk, get this. An experiment is an analog computer that solves all of the equations all of the time exactly with no round-off error. Boundary conditions are poorly known, meaning if I'm running my piston engine in the lab, that engine is solving all the equations all the time. But if you were to ask me, what's the mass flow rate of air into it? That's a boundary condition. And I go, ugh, we've got to measure it. And, and then you might ask, OK, it's going in a hole like that big. You might ask, what's the velocity profile in front of that hole? And I go, uh, we didn't measure it. We don't know. So boundary conditions poorly known. Now here is the flip of that is a numerical simulation solves approximate equations approximately. So the equations, we leave out terms because we say, ah, you don't need that term. So it's an approximate equation. And then a numerical machine approximates the equation. So you're, you're solving approximate equations approximately. And the boundary conditions have to be specified exactly. So if I'm running a model of 
something coming into my engine, I have to tell the computer what the velocity profile is. So now here's the key thing. Judicious use of both is best for progress. And so in our research program, we, we do both experiments and we do numerical simulations and we try to keep it balanced, what we're showing you now. Um, we have three different, uh, at least three engines in the lab. This is the workhorse. It's called the uh, CFR engine. That's the one that has the variable compression ratio. How am I doing on time? Yeah. And uh, here's uh, the one that uh, uh, Hunter here and Greg work on uh, the most. It's a four-cylinder engine, and it's kind of hidden in there, right? There's, there's actually a Volkswagen four-cylinder engine in there, and uh, that's been a, a workhorse for us. This engine right here is a single-cylinder, 2.5 liter. So it's a, a single. We haven't used it much in the last five years. Most of our research is done on these two engines, and we'll get on with that and show you. So that's my, that's my research tools. Uh, I collaborate with the Livermore Lab, because, and uh, I think uh, people in AS&T know that uh, uh, computers still can be massive and really huge and large, even though most people, when they when we talk about a computer, they're thinking of their laptop or that box that's on their desk. Uh, we still work with people who have very large computational facilities. And uh, I, I'm, what's some of the numbers here? It contains, uh, what, 8,000 processors, and it has a... Uh, one million times the memory of a 64 megabit PC and so on. Um, and yet, some of the problems we, we work on take several days on this machine. So uh, it's easy to, for, the, for the computational jobs to get big. Now I'm going to talk, we talked a little bit about fuels. We'll probably get back to talking about fuels in a minute. But here's what our research uh, engine is over here. We work with homogeneous charge compression ignited engines. It's kind of a new concept. Uh, an old concept of spark ignited, so there's a spark plug, and as the piston gets near top dead center, you fire the spark plug, and a flame starts to grow from that uh, kernel right there. In the diesel engine, uh, also called compression ignited engine, that's spark ignited, compression ignited, uh, as the piston gets near top dead center, we, we uh, have, have a higher compression ratio, so the air gets hotter, and we squirt in fuel that simply auto ignites. As it enters, it feels the hot air, it starts to burn. Now, that's just the opposite of what you want for gasoline. Remember, gasoline, I told you, you wanted fuel that didn't fall apart while it's getting hot. Because if it does fall apart, it knocks. So gasoline requires not fall apart. Diesel fuel requires fall apart. So a diesel engine wants fuel that will, that, uh, you know, shot into this hot air ignites. And hence the difference between diesel fuel, gasoline. Now, here's an engine that's kind of a mix of the, of the two engines. And by the way, the diesel engine has a higher compression ratio because we really want to get the air hot. This engine, if we compress it too much, it knocks. So the spark engine is compression limited. And we're stuck because we sell octane number around 90 or 87. Does anyone remember what's on the pump? It's actually written there, right? It, it's, it's 87? Yeah. Okay, so, so we're fixed with that. That says that the compression ratio on the car is going to be something like uh, 9 or maybe 10 to 1. If you go to 11, probably you're going to get knock. So we don't, you know, they tend not to go there. The diesel engine, by comparison, is upwards like 15 to 1. And the efficiency of these kind of machines is, is related to the compression ratio. So the diesel just has a better advantage already just by virtue of higher compression ratio. Um, I'll give you a number, like a, a diesel could be 40% efficient, spark engine could be 30% efficient. Now here is a hybrid engine called homogeneous charge compression ignited, and that is, rather than shooting the fuel in like this, we inhale it, but we just compress it until finally it explodes. So it's kind of both engines, that is, it's, it's a compression, like a homogeneous charge like this engine, but it comes to compression ignition like this engine, and so we call that the HCCI engine. And the, the trouble, okay, so that's a great research topic. It has a higher compression ratio. That's good. The fuel is homogenous, and so we don't have regions of soot and high temperature regions where you get nitric oxide. It's all spread out. And low temperature, even after the burn, the temperature doesn't have any hot spots. And we make it a lean charge. Lean charge means less nitric oxide, also means uh, less soot. So this thing looks extremely promising that I have an engine that has diesel-like efficiency uh, but doesn't produce the smoke of a diesel engine and doesn't produce the nitric oxide. So, hmm, why, not, why doesn't everybody run this engine? Uh, well, we'll see. It's not without some problems, and that uh, makes our research topics. 
This is the same thing. I'm showing you a crank angle picture right here. And a, uh, my homogeneous charge engine is this green line where I compress and finally it all explodes and there's a heat release that happens in a few crank angle degrees. In a diesel, you shoot in the fuel, it goes in for a while, and then finally it catches on fire and then you keep shooting in more fuel. And so that, that's why you have two humps in a diesel. So the, the burn rate is a lot and then a little bit more as you shoot in the fuel. And a spark engine is this red line. It just You start to spark here, the flame crosses over the piston, uh, builds up to a big fireball, and then it burns out all the fuel. So the uh, these diesel, gasoline, and then my homogeneous charge, it has the issue that the heat release is all at once, and that's too much. It actually uh, damages the piston to have it, this pressure rise uh, too much, and so you'd think it'd be easy, and part of our research is to widen that that uh, heat release curve. Uh, surprises me with a lot of chemistry background that I have, it's not been easy and, and we haven't been very successful. Uh, here's a picture from a, a, a piston engine that has a glass roof in it and it shows a spark over here where you start to spark at minus six degrees and there's a flame kernel growing. It's growing more as the flame's crossing over the piston and here we're still showing it growing. Uh, across the piston. If, if you bother to do the calculation, this stuff here is colder than that stuff there. And by being colder, it's more dense. And you come to find out that there is, a, although it looks like the flame's halfway across, it turns out due to the fact that this is denser, this has only burned about 25% uh, of the charge. So there's still a lot more burning that has to take place in this picture. Meanwhile, in a homogeneous uh, charge, we can see that the whole event more or less starts at plus four and is gone, completely exploded in six degrees. And so that's, that's a sudden pressure rise, hard on the parts. Well, you think it's a new concept, and you're, we're working on this, and one of the early papers was like 1990 on a homogeneous charge engine. But then we looked back and found this picture in a motorcycle book from 1952. And uh, well, how do you know it's a homogeneous charge compression ignited engine? Uh, it has no spark plug, okay, no spark plug on this engine, and it has no fuel injector, so it's not a diesel. So the, the fuel is uh, on some bottle here, you've got to study it. I think that's the fuel line coming right down there. And here's the piston right there, and if you bother to look, there's a very coarse screw right here, and you can rotate it. Okay, and it, and it pushes a plunger in and out of the chamber, and you're changing the compression ratio. And that rotator goes up to a hand grip. So you, driving this bicycle, adjust the compression ratio. And if the compression ratio is too high, then this thing will uh, ignite before top dead center, uh, and that's too early. And if the compression ratio is too low, it won't ignite at all. So you, the driver, sit there and adjust the compression ratio uh, for this, this bike, and uh, by the way, it said uh, also to, for this fuel, it said mix three parts gasoline to two parts diesel fuel. So they were looking for something that's between gasoline and diesel in terms of the diesel would auto-ignite easily. That's what diesel does. And gasoline doesn't auto-ignite at all, or tries not to. And so here's a blend. And we actually could consider that even now. It's, it's conceivable you could go up to a pump with an HCCI engine and put in half gasoline, half diesel. You might have to do that. So um, always interesting to look at farm equipment of the uh, turn of the century, the 1900, and see it turns out there was some HCCI engines back then, engines that had no spark plug and were not fuel injected. So we re rediscovered that. Um, here's the four-cylinder Volkswagen engine, and the key thing I want to show you is, okay, I got four cylinders firing. We're lucky to have that, so one, two, three, four, and notice, you know, quite a high, that's pressure, that's a pressure pulse. So the pressure's coming up, then the thing explodes and we get that jump like that. And that's another cylinder, another and another, okay? Uh, a lot of, very busy here, but here's the key thing you want to do is, where's the nitric oxide here? It's logarithmic and it goes way down. These numbers right there, that's 10 to the zero, so that's one, uh, uh, one part per million, right? I mean, it's incredibly low nitric oxide. We're usually used to dealing with 1,000 parts per million of nitric oxide out of an automobile. So the HCCI engine is fulfilling that promise of having low NOx. Uh, I think I just told you that. Yep, okay. And then I told you that. I'm going to do a computation uh, on the HCCI engine. I just wanted to show you that, yeah, we, we, 
it, because it's homogeneous charge, it's fairly easy for us to break this piston. So I'm showing you a piston ring wall there. That's the center of the piston. Piston's going up in a chamber there. And we break it into 10 zones. And there's 10, the very center, 9. And then we have a lot of zones along the wall here. This is called a crevice. Okay, so pistons have a crevice. And we're going to do a numerical model where we merely compress everything and just let the uh, chemical kinetics cause explosion, okay, uh, uh, once it gets hot enough. And so each one of those zones is shown in this light, uh, right here on this slide. And notice the zones that are in the crevice don't get hot enough because there's too much heat transfer to the walls. So looky here, it doesn't get hot at all, doesn't get hot. And so it turns out it doesn't get hot, so it doesn't burn. And, yeah, I guess it already changed for me, yeah. Where are we at? Okay, let's go to the next one. So here's what you can do with a computer, for example. Here's the base case right there, and you ask yourself, what happens if I have no crevice? Suppose I just get rid of that crevice. Okay, that's one option. Another option is, well, somebody might say, you know, the reason uh, we, we could get all that stuff to burn if we made a hot wall right there. So we'll make the wall hot. And uh, alternatively, we can make the wall hot and, and we'll have no crevice. Now, this is something that's hard to do in the actual engine. I don't know how to make an engine with no crevice. You know, the piston's got to move up and down that uh, gap. But we can do this experiment numerically, and this is too hard for you to kind of read. It just says this is just by changing the swirl ratio, it had no effect because one means uh, it changed nothing. It's back to where we were. But if we have a hot wall, it reduced the amount of carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons by substantial, like one-third, and if you take and have no crevice, you discover that you get rid of entirely the hydrocarbons. So you're highly motivated to build an engine that has no crevice because the hydrocarbon emissions are a problem. So we have an engine that has low nitric oxide but still emits hydrocarbons. And why? It's because of the crevice. So we've thought about it, but we don't have any clever way of making an engine uh, without a crevice. If you can think of one, uh, first go to the patent shop and then come talk to me, okay? Okay. That's, that's as much as I want to say on that talk. I'm going to move to another one, if I get this stop, about how I make electric power using this engine. Okay. And that talk's right here. So we, we, we make HCCIs in the lab. And I said to the state of California, well, I can make an engine that burns poor gas out at the landfill site, okay? And that's, we'll talk about a landfill like right now, if I can get this thing to open up. A landfill um, is a remarkable place. Uh, it's where all of our trash ends up. And they lay down plastic pipes, and then they bury it with dirt, and maybe they put some plastic uh, sheets over that, but uh, they often use some, some clay. And in the course of the next 20 years, all the wood and paper that we buried uh, is biodegrading by some, uh, uh, some bacteria is, is reacting with it and producing methane. The methane is collected, and as it comes up out of this pipe, it's about half methane, it's half CO2, and then there's some other things that we put in there. And some of it is uh, uh, HCl, uh, hydrochloric acid, which comes from PVC pipes that we threw in there and plastic bottles and things. And also there's something called siloxanes, which it turns out a lot of the, uh, when you take a shower in the morning and you wash your hair with shampoo, that smooth, silky stuff, that's siloxanes. So that ends up in a landfill or it ends up at the sewer plant. Either way, it ends up in the gas stream that goes towards what I'm going to do with is an engine. So first and foremost, you have to clean siloxane out and the hydrochloric acid. We use filters and some condensation. So once you've cleaned that out, now you've got a clean methane stream. But it's half natural gas. It's partly, uh, it's half CO2, half natural gas, has some of these issues. Uh, so people say, well, you know, can you, if you try, because of some of these things that are in there, the siloxanes, it hurts a catalyst on the engine. So I said to the state of California, well, my engine doesn't need a catalyst after the engine to get rid of the nitric oxide because I don't make any nitric oxide in the first place. So that was the proposals. We said we'll go to a landfill, and that's kind of a distant picture of a mountain, but that's actually the landfill, okay? So we did this for the state of California, and I'll just show you an interesting project. Uh, it was up in Butte County, and uh, here's a picture of California. There's Butte County, and what else is in Butte County is 
the brewery for Sierra Nevada beer, right? That's in Chico, Butte County. You all knew that, right? Okay, we've talked about the homogeneous charge compression ignited engine, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on this one. Uh, now, here's a remarkable thing, and this is what gives great headaches to all of us in the homogeneous charge compression ignited engine field. Here's a six-cylinder engine, and each cylinder is behaving differently. Now, to, to, to my control of people, this is very exciting. Um, and my, my first reaction to this was, this is a total headache. I can't imagine how I'm ever going to get this engine to operate. Uh, turns out, the controls people said, no, nope, no problem. You have a microprocessor on the machine, and all we have to have is some means of adjusting each cylinder independently. And, and by the way, why do cylinders behave differently is that the HCCI process is so temperature sensitive that the fact that the cooling water enters the block at one end and flows to the other causes the cylinders to be slightly hotter at the back end than the front end. And we see that. When Greg runs his engine, if he doesn't compensate for the fact that the front cylinder is colder, then it will misfire. And uh, amazingly, he can adjust his engine by 4 or 5 Kelvin to bring everything back into line. So w once you start to step up to the challenge, say, I'm going to have to control each cylinder by itself, it turns out it's not that hard. And, and much of the research we're doing in our group is, what are the various ways that you can control uh, the timing in these engines? Okay, and there's, there's a whole bunch, okay? Well, let's see what we did. Um, here, much of Greg's research is right here, is that um, I'm going to back up and say here is, you know, this is a pressure trace, and we, we have a pressure transducer built into the head of the engine. You have to drill a hole, mount it, and so on. That pressure transducer is like $1,000 per channel, kind of pricey. And we have, we've often wondered how are we ever going to get this into a production car. It's going to cost too much. I mean, the pressure transducer will cost more than the engine. So we look at a spark plug, which we... Uh, that's a spark plug, basically, and we call it an ion sensor. And if we can just put what amounts to what? What do you got here, Greg? 27 volts. Most recently, Greg's got like 140 volts across this circuit. And we're showing that you actually, when there's an explosion in there, there's a, a chemi-ions are produced. Not many, but you can, you can see them. So here's the ion signal happening right there at five, five crank angle degrees after top dead center. And here's the pressure from the uh, pulse doing that thing. And so we start to say, hey, we might have an opportunity to control the HCCI engine with a low-cost ion sensor. So that's just an example of one of the research topics we have. Um, back to the landfill. Oh, this is graphics. Forget it. I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. I'll move. I know the next one's a little bit better here. So this is the six-cylinder engine that we put, moved to the landfill, and we have an air-to-air -air, uh, heat exchanger because we've got to make the gases going into the engine hotter than room temperature or they won't auto ignite. So the way we get the auto ignition at top dead center is to preheat the air that goes into the engine. And so and that's a liquid to air heat exchanger. It's actually how we start it up. But after we get going, the exhaust goes through this thing and we, we extract heat from the exhaust to preheat the air that goes into the engine. And then we just have controllers uh, on there's control valves. Well I'll I have a, I got a better picture coming up. Right there is the intake manifold, and I've got a little trim heaters on each one of those throats so that I can fine-tune the temperature into each cylinder. We'll see more of that. Now, enough. Never mind. I'm showing you three cylinders of that engine, and notice they're all at slightly different temperatures on the intake. And that's what I have to do to control it is those kind of things. Are, that's what I have to do is control that temperature. And if I do that correctly, here's a coefficient of variance, very small. That means that it's a good, reliable engine. It's firing well every time. Okay, enough of that. Um, this is the whole picture showing you the temperature across the, uh, the whole engine. So it looks like I've got to preheat a lot more. As I told you, the very first cylinder, and that's probably the one that first sees the water cooling. So I've got to preheat the air a little bit hotter to go make this thing work. Let's see, never mind that. We've done that. Um, the contract said we would run it for six months, and this is the longest an HCCI engine has ever run, to my knowledge. And uh, there we started in May, and we ran it out on the landfill. And, we, it, of course, the first several months, it kept quitting on us. We had to go fix things, find out why did it quit. 
start building into longevity, and we finally got lots of hours in the last couple of months. So uh, it, it worked. We're happy for that. Uh, I'm just showing you that we, we have a controller on it that, even though the engine's going at 1,800 RPM, the controller doesn't have to be that robust. It, uh, we made a step change, and it takes us you know, many seconds here, 50 to 90, 40 seconds to respond to a step change. Now, in an automobile, you take it for granted that your car, when you put your foot down, the car accelerates and takes off. You know, we have to do this also. Then uh, your, your HCCI engine is going to be, have to respond much quicker. Uh, that's a challenge. But in the last six weeks, and I should have brought you the web page, uh, both uh, Chevrolet and uh, Mercedes have announced that they have HCCI cars. Okay, and so I asked Chevrolet, well, how many you got? And uh, the guy didn't say anything, one of my fellow researchers. And I said, well, where are they? And he didn't say anything. And then something else, he didn't say anything. And somebody from Ford told me, he says, Bob, they can't tell you anything. You know? So auto companies don't talk a lot about their products that are about to be released. And so you've know, I, 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 you got to visit the web page. Are you looking at the time? Oh, you are. OK. Uh, this is the whole reason that we do HCCI. The engine out there in the landfill that Spark ignited is putting out 750 parts per million of nitric oxide. Our engine's putting out five. And if we lean it out, it's even less than five. So the HCCI technology is remarkable for its low pollution characteristics. The efficiency is good. And um, you know, I have to tell you that the, 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 the biggest damaging part about HCCI is that this number right here is 0.3. Whereas in uh, a, uh, uh, an engine that's using spark ignition, it's stoichiometric. So it's, point, it's 1, 1.0. 1 so here I'm burning one-third the amount of fuel that I would have burned with the same engine in a spark mode. And at first you think that's good because I'm burning less fuel, so that's good for the economy. But actually, it means I'm making one-third less power. And so if I had, if you will, a 300 kilowatt engine, it's now 100 kilowatts. And that bothers a lot of people. They just, they, they don't want to sacrifice the power. And so our research focuses on, or works in part, of how do we gain the power back? And, uh, and, and turbocharging is certainly one way to do that. That is, it packs more air into the cylinder, and therefore more fuel, and, and doesn't raise the temperature. It's just more air into the cylinder, but the actual temperatures don't change. And so... That's at least one way of going about this. But of course, you can also turbocharge the spark engine. So in a way, you say, well, I'll turbocharge the, uh, the uh, HCCI engine. Well, it's not a fair comparison, because you should compare the turbocharged spark engine to the turbocharged HCCI engine, and you end up with this one-third problem. So people aren't rushing into buy HCCI engines just yet because of this, this power density issue. Um, that's pretty much it, I think. That's a better picture of the landfill right there. This is an interesting number. This is just California alone. Okay, there's 360 landfills, and I've come to find out, Hunter and I have a proposal into the California Energy Commission, that something like only 10% of them are actually doing something with the gas to convert it to electricity. The rest of them are just burning it in a, in a pipe. So there's great opportunities. And when I say power to the people, that's partly what I meant was uh, some entrepreneur could try to make some HCCI standard engine, and you'd just cobble it together out of existing engines. So you'd start with a diesel engine and do the things we did to it. That is, you have to have some kind of heat transfer device to preheat the air going into the engine. Um, you'll have to be able to adjust each cylinder, but uh, it doesn't have to be a real good controller. It has to have only a you know, time response of less than a half a minute. Uh, it's conceivable that you could go into some kind of business. And we see that there's 4.8 gigawatts of power. Uh, and this is what we gave to the state of California about a year ago, well, even less, six months ago. And they come back to us and told us to, to at least make a paper study of what these products would look like. Um, and so we did, OK? And that's, uh, yeah, just says that I could, I, we could do that and, and where we'd buy all the parts. Um, the actual landfill in, in uh, uh, Butte County is called Neal Road. So we're just saying that place alone has got nearly three megawatts of potential power. Um, 
if you're in this business, you, you learn to make these small comparisons. Uh, we are paying typically 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Well, that's also $100 a megawatt hour, okay, multiplied by 1,000. So um, this right here says that you would be getting something on the order of 300 bucks an hour to operate an, uh, this uh, landfill. Okay, so 300 bucks an hour. Uh, there's 10,000 hours roughly in a year. It's 8,000, but 10,000. So you see there's $3 million right there a year. Uh, so there, there's, there's, there's a business opportunity here. Okay, and Hunter and I are going to quit our university job next week and uh, do this, all right? I think that's pretty much my talk conclusion. So we think the land, landfill gas, homogeneous charge, compression, ignited engine uh, is viable technology, particularly with, you know, low BTU gases. Now, uh, I'll end, and then I'll tell you about uh, my Enron experience, if you want to hear that. There. Uh, any time for a quick question? I just don't know. That's you know, fair question. And and it's it's remarkable in that there's so much I can um, want to talk about here, and I know people might have to leak out. You know, landfill is a fascinating place. I mean, people bring things there, and you have to, and you you pay money to leave it there. So in particular, uh, I, I I'm out at the landfill site that's down here by Fremont, and there I see the spark ignited engines, and they're one one megawatt each, and there's seven of them. Okay, so there's seven megawatts of power going on, drawing off a landfill. Uh, the wood that's dropped there, the person who drops the wood, it's either the green waste that we put in those bins in, the, uh, in, in our house, but also scrap lumber from construction projects. All that wood is brought there and dropped, and it's, it's uh, 40 bucks a ton for the privilege to leave it there. $40 a ton. And so then I ask, well, how many tons a day? And the guy says, oh, we're doing at least 1,000 tons a day of wood. And these numbers are huge, okay? So then I start saying, okay, I will take that wood and let's try burning it mentally to say, how much, how much is that? It turns out it's 30 megawatts. So, so then you start thinking, wait, 30 megawatts, $100 a megawatt hour, uh, that's 3,000 bucks an hour. Is that a deal? And the answer starts out, yes, very, very much so, okay? So it's uh, 3,000, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I can't do that number, 10,000. How much is that a year? 30, 60 million, 60 million dollars a year. So Hunter has a friend uh, in Arkansas uh, who makes power plants. And so uh, we ask him how much for a power plant. And he says 70 million bucks. It all works. And so there you are. You're making 60 million a year. Cost you 70 million dollars. And so your payback is just over a year. It starts to look interesting. Uh, however, you've got an air quality permit. And, and, uh, and that's sort of also our combustion business, is how do we, how do we then make sure that a wood-fired plant is clean enough? And we don't, we don't uh, have the answer to that just yet. There are wood-fired plants in the state, but they were all put in 20 years ago. And, and so nowadays, the air quality requirements are going to be tougher. We know that will add to the cost of the plant, so is that a deal? So this is uh, entirely analogous to another thing, is, is the biodiesel fuel. And that is all those restaurants collect the oil, and then they pay somebody $100 to come pick it up. So you would think that the biodiesel would be free. Uh, but in fact, no, it costs a lot of money to have that fleet, to have somebody go out and collect that stuff. And so uh, it, it's just interesting that uh, analogous to the landfill, the, the wood that goes there, they actually get paid to leave it, $40 a ton. So there, there's, it's an interesting economy. I do think that with the, uh, the interest now in burning the wood because it's green fuel and, and PG&E and all the other power companies have been told that their, their makeup of their electricity should be 20% green by 2012, 2015, I forget. But it's actually it's this CO2, global warming, that's now driving the issue of what to do with the wood at the landfill. Formerly, we, just, we either composted it, which meant we just threw it out on farm property, or else we buried it. Uh, but now it's the, uh, we could have we could have burned that wood any time in the last hundred years. But only now are we doing it because it's CO2 neutral. It's 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 wood. The wood came from trees. It's not fossil fuel. That's a long uh, answer to what you know what happens to all the wood in landfill. I don't know. Next. 
The, he said, how do you filter out siloxane and HCl? Uh, as two ways. One is uh, use just uh, activated carbon filters, okay, which you have to replace, you know, and actually when you're done with that, you throw them in the landfill, okay? <laughs> so uh, the other one actually is a refrigeration process where you cool the gases down to about 35 Fahrenheit. And that causes uh, the, uh, all these gases off the landfill are very humid. You cool it down, it rains, that is the dew point, and uh, wet, moist air is good at mopping up the HCl and the siloxanes. And then uh, it's a countercurrent heat exchanger, so that cold gas goes back over itself, if you will, and warms up a little bit. So the refrigeration uh, 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 cost is, is it, it's something, but not too bad. Well, I'll give you one last thing, okay. In 1999, uh, just before we started into our, the California's energy crisis, I was approached by a venture capital group, and they said, can you make a gas turbine out of turbocharger parts that would generate 100 kilowatts of power? And the, the market was uh, Costco, Safeways, uh, Kmart. All of these stores use nominally 300 kilowatts of power, and if we generated power right there on site, uh, we could also use the waste heat to heat the building, or you can use waste heat to, to run actually a refrigerator, right, um, through absorption chiller. So we were pretty excited uh, about this uh, venture capital deal, and uh, I worked on it, and three of my Ph.D. students wrapped up their Ph.D. and joined this company, and uh, we got busy, and we got $8 bucks. okay, everything was fine, and then uh, uh, after about 18 months, they had spent it, and I was consulting and going at least one day a week over to, uh, it was on the Alameda in uh, the old Naval Air Station, airplane hangar, and... Then we went back and got uh, eight million more, and uh, it was actually from Enron. And it was Enron that was funding us because here in California they had lots of natural gas, and they saw that the natural gas was low cost and electricity was high cost, and so they just wanted to convert their gas to electricity. And also, one-stop shop, that is, they were going to sell these turbines by going to Safeways, who has 1,400 stores, and say, why don't you put one of these at each store? You know, and you'll have lower cost electricity. Um, and as it turned out, um, I went back to Enron uh, in August of 2001 to ask for more money, and they said we're broke. And I flatly didn't believe it, you know. I mean, and I was one of the first people to know that Enron was in trouble, but I, I didn't think they were. So, uh, uh, and, but Enron was kind, and they introduced us to some uh, venture capital banks in uh, Manhattan. And Manhattan Venture Capital for Energy is done largely in New York, not in Silicon Valley. So that was all good. And then it turns out that was August. Now it's September 11th, 2001. And uh, geez, it, it took me an embarrassingly long period of time before I realized that my this startup company had just died, uh, because the venture capital out of New York just it just didn't happen. And and uh, and so that company we uh, we laid off 33 people on August sorry October 30th. And and as it turned out, there really is no market for that turbine. And engineers are totally capable of making a wonderful product for which there's no market. And, I, and I'll take the last 30 seconds here and tell you why there's no market. We were asking Safeways to negotiate with the gas company to get a natural gas contract and pay the gas bill. We were asking Safeways, a, a manager at Safeways, to have an air quality permit. We're asking the person at Safeways, if you will, to have... Uh, a finance arm to pay for this machine and and also to maintain it and, and so it was just it's too much you see that and the, and the Safeways people will tell you look we sell beans and potatoes and things we're not power managers so the right answer for this to ever work if you're ever going to get power to the people is that you have to take on all these responsibilities yourself so if a uh, Mohammed here and I start a company, that company is going to have to build this product, but we're going to have to be able to you know, finance it. We're going to have to have a certain person in our company that does strictly air quality permits, and so every time we plant one of these engines,